Welcome to Dream Machine. My name is Aaron. And my name is Patricia. And I have to say to you all, why did you make me do this? Oh, <laughs> do this. What? Well, I, let me let me say if you say this. Um, not only is this film, I, here, and also I want to be very careful here because I do know that this movie that we're about to talk about does have a cult following, and so there are some yeah, very. But it has a but it has a cult following in the most ironic way. Yeah, but I mean, but also there's actually people who like this movie, and uh, Fair so enough. here's the thing: like, I if you like this movie, then good for you. But I mean, I hope when I when we're done with this episode of Dream Machine, I really hope people can understand my point of view with this because let me safely say this: not only from a movie reviewer point of view, um, do I have some problems with this movie? This movie, I feel, also has a personal reflection about myself, which I really need to kind of go into. So this this episode is going to be very interesting. So, uh... Welcome to Aaron's Therapy Hour, everybody. Yeah, welcome to my thought. Are we going to talk about this for an hour? Oh, no. Oh. Yes, we are. So... I'm, not sure if I can afford... I'm not sure if I can afford an hour of therapy at the moment. At least, at least <laughs> Don't I worry. The table. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I can assure you, everybody. So please get yourself comfortable as we're going to be discussing about the insanity. And you better believe it's going to be a long No, Patricia, can we have no B puns, please? Can we just, 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 oh. Okay, let's just let's just tell everybody what we're talking about, and then we'll get into it. Sure. What, what is that? What is that? What is it? Oh no! Not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! So, B-Movie is a 2007 Golden Globe-nominated CGI animated film starring uh, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, Rennie Zellweger, Matthew Broderick, John Goodman, uh, pa Patrick Warburton, and Chris Rock. Uh, B-Movie was the first most ambitious script to be written by Seinfeld. And so, um, where do we begin with this? I mean... How about, the f how, about how this movie first came to be? Um, tell, and, and, tell no, 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 no. I'm, not, I'm not doing a B-pun. I'm serious. Yeah, so, so, tell, tell me, uh, Patricia, how did we get here okay so you can hear more information about this in the very first episode of the animated anarchy podcast where one of the co-hosts of the show actually knew someone who worked on this movie so apparently it all started when jerry seinfeld and steven spielberg went to lunch and he decided to pitch this idea about you know i have this idea for a movie it's me as a bee and Steven Spielberg was kind of like iffy about it, but then he decided to like pitch this a little bit further. And he's like, you know, I can get some of my old friends and colleagues who worked on Seinfeld with me and we can write all these episodes. Um, you write this the script of the movie and we can pitch it to you. And then, you know, Spielberg was like, OK, we'll, we'll see what happens. So, you know, you know did, Patricia, and, let, let's do ahead. it. Let's do some role playing here. Um, sure. Let me let's uh, both of us. Let's say we go to lunch and uh, let me just uh, put in the first sentence uh patricia yes aaron i can see myself in a movie as a camel okay and what would you do as a camel um i do camel related puns like uh um like uh, how the people like my hump and my lady lumps and uh <laughs> and uh how much water that i need to drink and i roam around in a desert and uh you know, let's let's bring some religion into it. Maybe I could be one of the camels that you know host the free wise men. It's like, oh wait a minute, we've done the star, so like we can't do that. Okay then, goodbye, Patricia. Have, have fun next week. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, don't call us. We'll call you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like that's how that conversation should have gone. Okay, but nope, we got this. Yeah. Um, now let me ask you something. I mean, I don't know how hugely popular Seinfeld was in the UK, but. What are your thoughts on it? Because I remember, like, around the 90s, Seinfeld was, like, one of the most influential comedies that ever came out. We... It was... Well, well we knew of it. I think... Uh, and I think, to be fair, like, um, because The Simpsons constantly referenced it, too, I think uh, it was in the British consciousness. And maybe there are some British Seinfeld fans out there, I think. And I think it was on mainstream television. But I think the biggest main import, I think, at that within that time frame, I think, was Friends. I think. Uh, okay. So. Okay. I can see that. So yeah, a lot of people have a lot of fond memories of Seinfeld. There's a lot of episodes that people still bring up. There's a lot of quotes that people still bring up. 
Um, you know, a lot of people remember such things like Jerry wearing the pirate's um, shirt and the soup Nazi and, um, you know, hold all those things. So, um, yeah, even after Seinfeld ended its run in 1998, which lasted for almost a decade, believe it or not, because it ran since 1989, um, it, it was kind of still being reran on television and a lot of um, a lot of sitcoms were kind of taking some of their influences from Seinfeld. So it was still kind of very popular. And and Jerry didn't, Seinfeld didn't was still end up, doing... did, uh, Didn't they all end up in prison at the end of the show? Yeah, they did. Okay. Even though that was kind of, it, I mean, I guess this was kind of like when, you know, the show was kind of like losing its luster. Yeah, it's like, but, it's a really weird kind of way to end the show. It's kind of like, it's kind of the same way, like, kind of like dinosaurs kind of ended with like, you know, the, the Ice Age happening. The old, yeah, like, but that kind of makes sense because they're dinosaurs and it was kind of inevitable. And Mark Jacobs, who was the co-creator of Dinosaurs, they didn't want to continue the series and they felt that this was the best way to end it, which, you know, fair enough. And also, um, you know, and Roseanne, oh God, we've, we've talked about the ending of Roseanne on the Aaron Meta show, so you can go listen to that. But yeah, there's been a lot of weird endings or unsatisfying endings in sitcoms, but uh, nonetheless, um, so after J Seinfeld ended, Jerry went off to continue his stand-up, and you know, it seems like Jerry seems to have a kind of like a, a niche audience, and only like pertaining to uh people who really liked his stand-up i don't know about the younger generation about how they feel about seinfeld some people say that he's kind of old hat and i'm not even joking i think i remember in an interview once where jerry's like oh you know the younger generation doesn't get it which made me remind which kind of reminds me of that simpsons episode in which when you know um uh you know principal skinner was like asking himself like What's going on? Am I just losing out of touch? No, it's no, the kids. The kids fault. are the wrong. Yeah, cool. yeah, the kids are the wrong. Yeah. So basically, he wanted to. I think for why he wanted to do this movie was to appeal for a newer generation, and essentially he pitched it to Steven Spielberg, saying, "I want to see myself as a B for a kids' film," and then eventually, you know, he brought in a lot of his alumni writers and some of his, um, you know, uh, some of the even some of the the cast members. Um, to be in this movie. And basically, long story short, this is how it came to be. As um, the co-host of the Animated Anarchy podcast even stated, this is our generation's ro uh, Rover Dangerfield because the essentially the same thing happened in which Rodney Dangerfield uh, and... Um, what was it? Uh, he decided to pitch this idea to an animation studio saying, hey, uh, what would it be like if I was uh, a dog and I was doing a whole bunch of my jokes and then we got Rover Dangerfield and that turned out to be like a kind of a weird movie that was originally supposed to be a rated R movie, but then it was turned into a kid's film and it became a mess. And mm -hmm. the same thing happened in this one in which essentially this movie is just so all over the place and so insane that I don't even know what to think of it. I, I, this movie was forgotten for like almost a decade until it decided that, hey, this one guy decided to make it into a meme. And there were so many memes of B-movie, like um, you know, the entire script of B-movie in a t-shirt and in a YouTube video, like something would happen. It was for a long time, it was just meme potter or some, no, fodder. Daughter, it was yeah. meme fodder. So yeah, it's just I, I mean, I guess I missed out on that in, in that whole thing, but I mean, I somehow discovered like a small community of uh, people who seem to actually like this, which uh... yeah, and, and I can I can see the appeal, very similar to how DreamWorks did Ants. I guess this is a movie for people who like bees, and to be fair, the um, the life of a bee, it's kind of like what Ants maybe would have done, like talking about like what bees would do, but. Um, and that's fine and all, but everything else, like when they go over to the human world, that's when it just starts becoming like, what? I know, it's just, it's, uh, from the get-go of this film, you already see the problems. Um, the, it, there's bits in it where you feel like it's been cut for time, and then there are other bits where the, the puns are just rushed. And uh, then there are other bits where it's like, they, they don't really explain, the, the B world doesn't really get that properly explained. Like, uh, at the beginning, like, why on earth have they got cars? Why on earth are they doing this? It's like, it's just, it's such a massive 
contrast to what they started off with in regards to, you know, keeping this in mind, DreamWorks always like to kind of keep things, um, you know, within some kind of linear. Like in their 2D movies, like, you know, the animals never talked, um, the characters somewhat kind of looked the same, looked like they could actually exist within this same world. With this, I mean, like, ants and... You'd think Ants and B-Movie were made by two completely different studios. You know, yeah, you think about and, it. and yeah, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, comparing, you know, Woody Allen to Jerry Seinfeld is that their style of writing is completely different. Yeah. Now, now I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole controversies about Woody Allen. That, that's not the point here. Yeah, that's not- Woody Allen is very melancholy. He's very he likes to talk about more down-to-earth stories while jerry seinfeld is a stand-up comedian he wants to make you laugh with his jokes so with the you know basically when the writing of ants came to be it was like make it like a woody allen film very melancholy very down-to-earth um very poignant and that's what we got with ants in which it you know brings a little bit of you know controversies about working as a colony and individualism and with B movie, it's like, okay, we have this B who wants to become himself very similar to Z, except that he interacts with humans and unlike ants in which, you know, humans were barely there. Mm-hmm. And then we have, um, you know, him discovering that, oh, humans have been using honey. And so he's going to sue, you know, that, you know, he's going to sue them in court. And so because they have no, leeway into saying oh you're right we've been using your honey without your permission we're going to stop and then basically the whole ecosystem gets screwed over because bees have so much honey that they're not pollinating the flowers and then the flowers all die and then it's like the end of civilization as it is and and patricia that whole explanation just blows my freaking mind like it's like there's, there's i've probably got like maybe 30 40 questions about that whole explanation of that film. I mean, like, I mean, first of all, I mean, where does it say, I mean, why do the humans even listen to the bees? Like, why on earth are they, like, uh, I mean, as far as I'm aware, the, um, I mean, first of all, this film takes place, I mean, would you, you know, a shock and horror, New York City. Kind of like the oh, same place as... The- really? Really? I, I mean, yeah. why would it take place in New York? Could it be that Seinfeld took place in New York? <laughs> nah, but, I don't think but so. But it's like, if, if, don't you think about it? Like, most of these movies that, like, you know, like the Smurfs, like, uh, I mean, uh, the, the various other ones that have also taken place in New York, you know, a troll in Central Park, like, uh, you know, like... Uh, it's, all these- it's took place in New York. You no, know, it's took place in New York, yeah. Like, uh, I mean, you know, wouldn't it have been nice, like, just for once, like, if it like, took place in, like, I don't know, Louisiana, or something like that, you know, give us a bit of variety. Like, and then we all have to we'll have to wait two more years until Princess and the Frog for that. Oh, yeah, to happen. So. Uh, well, or, yeah, well, that's yeah, well, that New was Orleans, Disney. Louisiana, like, so. Yeah, but, that's true. But, but going back to my original, going back to my other point of um, you know saying that the Ants is drastically different from B Movie. But you know, here's the thing. You know, with Pixar, right? Like, you know, when we do like the whole Pixar theories, like uh, tying all the movies together, like at least that's plausible because, and you can say that these movies all exist within the same universe. You, you can't do that with DreamWorks here. Like, no, uh, I mean, even 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 though that we did discuss about that little uh, billboard cameo of Shrek in Monsters vs. Aliens, I think that was, like, probably the only time in which we've actually seen, like, a little Easter egg. But their animation styles are so different that you can't really put them in the same universe. And, you know, with um, Pixar, you can because they're, they look similar and because they have... You know, things like the Pizza Planet and the Dynaco uh, gas station, a few toys like, you know, the Nemo toy or the Buzz Lightyear toy. I mean, you could argue that, yeah, they do take place in the same universe. With DreamWorks, you can't really say that. Like, do the 2D and 3D animations are like two different universes? Yeah. I, it, it doesn't really make any sense. It, it, it doesn't. It's just. It's like. Well, you know. I. I like. Except there's a two D universe. I mean, the two D universe obviously is. You know. Is is, is the two D story of DreamWorks. I would say is done. I mean, we're not going to see another two D film. No, we're not. Movie. But you know, the, at least the three D uh, aspect of uh, of DreamWorks. Like, it's just. It's. Uh, there's no. And on top of that as well, when you compare Ants to B Movie, it makes you think that just uh, DreamWorks DreamWorks has downgraded itself. 
You know, like, okay, can you really say that, I mean, you look at an answer for a minute, like, you know, you can sympathize with Z. You can, uh, I mean, they even make Christopher Walking seem plausible as, like, you know, a side villain who then does a turn uh, at the end of the film. And, uh, yes. you know, there's so many other good story elements to it as well in Ants. In B-Movie, it's all over the show. It's absolutely all over the show. There's no consistency to the universe. Like, uh, I mean, at first it starts off kind of like, I mean, on top of that as well, it's so unoriginal as well. Like, they borrowed bits from, uh, I swear they must have borrowed bits from the Smurfs, borrowed bits from uh, Masters of the Universe out of all movies. They must have borrowed some bits from Ratatouille. Hell, there's even a model of a human that looks like Colette Tattoo from Ratatouille. Oh, if you notice in the car. Like, there's, and, uh, on top of that as well, what's that movie about when they tried to sue Santa Claus? I can't remember what it was. Um, oh, Miracle on 34th Miracle Street. Miracle on 34th Street. It, it, there's elements of that as well in the trial. And, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the trial scenes were awful to watch. I almost, like... I almost took my phone out and almost took an Instagram of it and me with my just like this horrible face and horrible look on my face saying, seriously, I'm watching this right now. That, that Montgomery lawyer, I hate that character. And, and that's really John Goodman do. as the, you know, and you know John Goodman as the judge, uh, and, and and John Goodman. I, I mean, he's a great actor, but and then you know the lawyer character. I forget who the lawyer was, but um, yeah, you have all these um, you know, characters that just feel so contrived, and they they just. I mean, it just kind of like brings a load to you, man. I, just, I don't just know. When, just when I thought John, just when I thought Fred Flintstone was John Goodman's worst character, here, here comes this, here comes this Montgomery bullshit. Like it's just, it's. Uh, I feel really bad for. You know, <laughs> I, I guess I shouldn't feel bad to him because he agreed to do it. So it's like it's not like he was forced into like doing it or anything like that. But uh, I mean, it's like yeah, it's just it's uh, that that the, those trial scenes. You know, we're inconsistent too. Like, I mean, I I didn't understand. You know, in this universe, apparently bees have the same rights as humans, which I mean, clearly yeah, they okay. don't because they had they did that whole uh, Schindler's List uh, looking kind of thing with. Uh, uh, okay, not exactly Schindler's List, but with uh, the whole bees in the beehive and and things like that, and uh, make them look like they're kind of like second class citizens. Like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I don't I don't want to make references to Django Unchained, but uh, I mean, it made them look like kind of like slaves to like uh, this uh, an oppressive system that humans put in is like uh, and, 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 it's, and it's completely wrong too because it's not like they're stealing every bit of the honey like we can see throughout the movie that they do actually have enough honey to survive and that's what you know really good really smart um be um ex you know be uh, honeycomb extractors do they basically just take enough honey so that they can be able to distribute it to stores and then they leave some honey for the bees because they know that they need to eat from it they don't just take every single bit of it and then just leave the bees to die that doesn't work that way i know, Otherwise I know some of that as well like uh, you know they even give honey back to the bees like they even even oh, they even give they even keep honey as stock to give them back in case they need it for the winter when you know there's no flowers around yeah, okay, now, if, now if, if you were to make the argument that, oh, they've taken every single bit of honey, like maybe if we had a scene in which, you know, they're in the, um, you know, they're doing like the little tour about how the honey is, you know, uh, being stored away in the, um, in the honeycombs, and then maybe all of a sudden they all fell asleep because of the gas, and then we see a hand like taking all of the honey, like every single bit of it, and then they wake up and it's all gone, then... You know, I can argue with that. It's like, huh, that's strange. This has been happening. This is this like the sixth time this has happened this week or this month or whatever. Uh, and then maybe like maybe the gas kind of like helps him forget. But maybe Barry kind of saw it like in a distance that this happened. And then he's like, oh, so that's how, you know, our honey is being taken away. Now I'm going to sue them because they've taken every single bit of our honey and we've worked so hard on it. You know, in Bugs Life, in which they had a deadline of getting all the food to the grasshoppers and they had to get every single one of them, even giving some of their own food. So, I mean, I wish that this movie would have been a little smarter in a sense that, you know, maybe it could have gone into that angle or maybe there could have been a nice balance between, you know, how the humans and how the bees interacted with how much, you know, honey, uh, you know, it takes. Or maybe humans wouldn't have been introduced at all. Maybe we could have had a different conflict like an ant. This, 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 should, this should have been a movie about rights. 
I think. I think that would have held far more weight than just like, oh, we want to hoard all the honey for ourselves and not let the humans take it. Like, that's, that's another thing as well. The court case was confusing to follow because it was like, first of all, it was like, oh, well, you know, they're taking all our honey and not without our permission. And uh, so I don't know whether, during the trial, I don't know if it was whether just like, you know, the bees wanted the honey back so they could sell it back to the humans so they can benefit from it as well, which kind of would not make, too much sense, I think, in that regard, because, I mean, how, I mean, as far as I'm aware, bees don't interact with the capitalist system of America, but, uh, I mean, and on top of that as well, like, it would, it just, it, then it turned into, oh, well, we want to hoard all the honey for ourselves, and then we don't uh, do any more, I mean, that makes no, not much sense either, because, like, they, they hoard all the honey back to themselves, and, uh, but then they don't see a reason to make any more of it. What happens when it runs out? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, what happens when it runs out and then one day they decide, oh, we need to get some more honey, we're starving. But then all of the flowers are dead because they haven't been pollinated. So that yeah. means that the bees would eventually die. I know. It just it's, uh, And I think uh, I can see they were going for that, but that wouldn't be the direction I would have gone in. I would have purely made the story about the rights of the bees. Like saying like, okay, well, you know, we're not, I mean, the, the fact that we're kind of kept as like, you know, the whole, you know, battery thing like being kept as slaves and like here's the bees fighting for their rights and so you know you see them doing kind of like activism kind of like uh, you know okay, so you make it kind of like I mean uh, again I don't want them to do like uh, I don't want to compare it to like the civil rights movements uh, of uh, the United States and it's definitely after we come off uh, Martin Luther King Day but uh, I mean um, at least kind of make it like you know here are these bees they're being suppressed by the humans and beekeepers and stuff and one bee decides to stand up and say enough is enough and I'm going to fight for my rights and uh, say that, you know, we deserve a bit more equal protection. Okay, things are, you know, not as bad, but I think we can do get we can get more and deserve more because we can talk and things like that. Because, you know, in this world, you know, they can interact with humans. They can, you know, do... They have the same... Apparently, they're all somewhat on the same wavelength like that. I mean, like, this purely should have been about rights, I think, for the bees. And not about, you know, hoarding all the honey for ourselves and causing an apocalypse. Mm-hmm. I think it's just it's yeah. It's... Oh, oh, but here's the thing. That's not. I, I mean, that is like the main focus of the movie, but they don't focus on that for very long because we do have another side plot. But there is no focus. This is the thing. The story's all over the show. Like uh, it's either. I mean, obviously you got the. Here's the, here's the positive thing about this. I do like the relationship between Barry and Vanessa. I think. Sure. And, uh, I mean, and first, the problem you know, with it is is that is that uh, the problem with it is is that it's confused. Like, because mm-hmm. it doesn't know whether it's telling a love story, or whether it's telling a story of like personal friendship. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that that's probably um, one of the things that a lot of people complain about. It's like it's very conflicted. It's like, you know, they are like hanging out together, and she has a boyfriend that is jealous of the bee, and it's like, are they friends? Are they um lovers it's uh, and here's the thing she is the owner of a flower shop and Mm -hmm. this would have been a great opportunity for maybe barry to um you know kind of have like a not 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 like a friend well i mean yeah friendship yes but kind of like a um what you call it like maybe a, a a way of kind of like she is this activist of bees like she wants to, you know, do well with the bees in terms of like, you know, planting all, uh, you know, selling all these flowers. And then she has a whole bunch of honey. And then maybe she kind of like sees the wrong of, you know, taking all the honey and then maybe kind of like siding with the bees. It's like, you know, trying to fight for bee rights. And, you know, that doesn't really go into that direction. And you're just wondering, like, what what did, what are they trying to do here? It's just, it's, well, this is the thing. They even confuse this whole, you know, is it supposed to be a love triangle? Is it supposed to be, uh, you know, a conflict of relationships? I mean, the way I would have fre- uh, the way I would have had it is that uh, you have this relationship between Vanessa and the boyfriend. I can't even remember his name. Uh, yeah, uh, Patrick Warburton. Pat- that's what his name uh, is. Patrick. Okay, so you have the relationship between Vanessa and Patrick. And uh, then, um, but then all of, you know, she has a, a more outgoing view of life and uh, is more open to the idea of uh, you know these bees or you know anything in in life kind of like you know the way Colette's and uh, you know in uh, Ratatouille you know I, here's the thing I say is borrows constantly from Ratatouille where he she Colette even believes that Remy at the end of the movie can cook and um, you know and also Gusto you know, also you know, in 
Remy's mind also believes that anyone can cook, including rats. And so, I mean, I would have Vanessa as kind of like that character who believes that anyone is capable of, in life of doing things and if they're passionate about it and things like that. So that's where her motivation comes in to help uh, Barry out with the court case to uh, get his rights back for, you know, obviously the honey distribution. And then, but then you'd, you'd see the amount of work that's currently going into the court case and it kind of distracts from Patrick and Patrick feels um, that he's not being, it's like he had this whole thing planned for like, himself and Vanessa and now all of a sudden this bees come in and this court case comes in and now all of a sudden that's eating up their time and then they're not spending as much time together. There's the conflict. It's 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 easy to write and yet somehow they've just screwed it up. You know? Yeah. It's just, oh my goodness. It was just... It, it's a... So there's that story, which you know, here's the thing about this. You know, you've got so many stories and story, story arcs currently going in and none of them you can really enjoy. Like, uh, the, I, I mean, there's, it, it's kind of like all over the place. It's like it, it it's kind of like a movie filled with moments like, oh, we have a moment with, um, you know, Barry and his parents. We have a moment with Barry and his best friend, Adam, who is, you know, voiced by Matthew Broderick. We have a moment with <laughs> we have a moment with Larry King. Yeah, Larry King. And, uh, and it, it, that got a little bit of a chuckle out of me, but uh, I mean, not yeah, really. Yeah, but it's just pointing out that it's just pointing out it's like, oh, you know, you're B Larry King. Well, in the human world, there's already a Larry King. It's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Is a very common name or something? Hmm. I guess that's pretty funny, but it's, I mean, like, why? I don't know. Yeah, it's just, it's... and then we have this one scene in which when he's trapped in the car and there's a mosquito voiced by Chris Rock that just doesn't last very long. Uh, it's it, it's like these little bits of moments that try to be a cohesive plot but it doesn't really pull itself together until like i don't know they, they get to the main plot where it's about the bees and them trying to get the flowers to pollinate again so that nobody dies it's just it's uh yeah it's um again, and, and it's another a, thing yeah, i want to bring up show. is it is it is this happening like from all over america or just in new york city it sounds like uh, here's the thing about this this is where i go back to because when you go throughout this movie you can see things have been cut you can see that in the intro that uh, they, there should have been more explanation for what was going on in the world but they had to cut it for time you had to have more explanation of the relationship relationship between uh, Barry and his uh, and his uh, parents but that was cut for time and then you have the whole thing with you know the flowers all dying and things like that and that was cut for, and I bet that was also cut for time and so you have this uh, ninth you really this uh, this movie could have gone on for a lot longer than it should have done thankfully it only goes on for an hour and a half but uh, I mean the the amount you can just see where things are just missing like you know there was I'm sure there were times where it was like that I'm sure there was supposed to be a scene uh, there where it should have been, you know, more explanation of uh, what was going on between uh, Barry and his conflict with his parents about uh, just, you know, goofing off and uh, not finding a job and, uh, you know, they, that's the thing. those scenes were actually stuck in there. But when you think of it, but then you realise that, um, you know, all out of nowhere, you know, you have him obviously suing the... Uh, the uh, the humans and uh, it's just yeah it's just, it's just I just feel very confused watching this because you know you have the parents saying oh you have to figure out what you're going to do with your life but he's he's suing the he's helping his race out by becoming a a, a lawyer or a, an attorney or whatever like you know yeah. like it wouldn't that be kind of like classed as kind of a job you know yeah um, that that would be because um you know that I, I guess it wouldn't be like an orthodox job for bees it's like what do you do. I get honey. What do you do? I distribute honey to the honeycombs. What do you do? I uh, make sure that the bees get the honey. What do you do? I make sure that the queen is okay. What do you do? I feed the little bee larva. It's like, I mean, lawyer is not something that's in there, but hey, it's unique. Yeah. And then at the end of the movie, he actually ends up opening his own legal firm for like of other animals to like sue the human race and obviously make their lives <laughs> even more difficult. Like you know, if, if if Harvey Birdman isn't isn't far out for you enough, here's 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 that here's that shit. You know, it's like uh, uh, just this um, yeah. So so there's that. 
So, that's the story. It's a confusing mess, and there's nothing really you can enjoy, and uh, so I guess we should talk about who voices these characters, and, uh, you know, um, Jerry Seinfeld, again, I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, but um, I've not watched Seinfeld, so I don't get Jerry Seinfeld's shtick. If you will, the, so. it, 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 the shtick about Jerry Seinfeld, uh, for those who are wondering, like, you know, what is his shtick? You know, what does he do? Well, a lot of the things that, you know, he does is that, um, you know how Seinfeld, the tagline is, it's a show about nothing. He basically just talks about everything that's going on in his life. And he talks a lot about like, you know, his time in New York city because he's Jewish. And, um, you know, he basically just, he, he does a lot of like non sequitur standups in which like, it doesn't really connect, but it's kind of like is very humorous for anybody who's listening to it. Again, like I said, it's a very niche audience kind of thing. You know, a lot of people may not get the jokes. I mean, personally for me, I don't really, you know, see, you know, Jerry Seinfeld as like very funny. I, I've never even seen too much of Seinfeld other than like, you know, the soup Nazi and the episode where Jerry gets the puffy shirt and, you know, episodes involving with, um, you know, Elaine and such like that. But um, yeah, I don't really know too much about, you know, Seinfeld either or on Jerry's, um, you know, comedy. So, um, you know, this would have been a great opportunity if Jerry really wanted to have a new generation of you know, kids to know about his uh, comedy skits, then I think that the story should have been a little bit more tighter and like, you know, take advantage of what Jerry Seinfeld's essence is. Very similar to how in Ants, you know, if you didn't watch movies from Woody Allen, such as like Annie Hall, then you would kind of get the essence of what a Woody Allen film is about. It, it's very melancholy. It's very down to earth. And uh, I'm not going to talk about like you should watch a Woody Allen film, especially with all the allegations that's going on. That's that, Again, that's not the point. But you get what Woody Allen is about. And to a, an extent, you kind of get what Jerry Seinfeld is about. And the way that this is written, it's... I don't know. I, I I think that kids would just be really confused with it and wouldn't find it funny. Yeah. So, so yeah. Jerry Seinfeld, I mean, obviously does his thing. Uh, Renee Zellweger is uh, Vanessa Bloom. She's actually kind of my favorite character in all of this, I think. Yeah, uh, and, to give, and given the fact that she was already, like, the female character in Shark Tale, that's an improvement. Yeah, that is. Uh, Matthew Broderick was uh, Adam Freeman, who's, uh, he was a supporting actor in, in this. Yeah. And, uh, but mind you, like, you know, they played up this whole thing, like, oh, if you sting somebody... It it can be fatal and like then he goes and stings somebody and then all of a sudden he just all that happens is that he ends up in the hospital for five minutes and then all of a sudden he's fine like yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know it's like a, you know some characters of you know that Matthew Broderick portrays as is gets the shaft yeah <laughs> It's it's a shame, yeah. but um, yeah, I I do like Matthew Broderick. I know a lot of people say that his performance is very you know wooden and very monotone, but you know I think that what he does is fine. But yeah, yeah his his character was kind of a throwaway. Yeah, it's a shame we didn't see much of Chris Rock in this film. Like, yeah, that's true. Like he was really funny for the t- short time he was in, but I guess. You know, his shtick was, you know, he was in Madagascar. They decided to throw in a little funny cameo in there. So, yeah, yeah but he, he uh, should have been the movie. Yeah, like, cause, like, my probably my favorite Joker in, in, in this, and I, I do admit it's a pretty weak joke, was uh, when he came in as, like, uh, his, um, his, as uh, Barry's assistant law, uh, attorney. And uh, he says, oh, well, I was a blood-sucking insect before I started this. They just gave me a bag. Like, you know, it's like, uh, that was, I do admit, that was a good joke. You know, yeah. Chris Rock. And, he, like, and his delivery the, like, was was good but that's the only thing i really enjoyed about this film really. yeah yeah exactly i mean the jokes either range from stupid puns to dark you know comedy to wackiness to uncomfortableness it, it, mm. it, it yeah, it's like you said it's a very mixed movie and i don't know uh, if any of the writers of seinfeld have done anything else but they clearly have never written a movie script before. Yeah. Um, so John Goodman again. I mean, I I know he's probably trying, but uh, the the fact that the animation is so awful and so goofy and uh, so and the delivery is just so terrible. Like uh, I could probably imagine that. May I don't think he can look at this performance with any you know, any any pleasure. I don't think. Mm. I don't know. Or, or maybe he's in denial saying like, oh, you know, the reason why the movie didn't do so well is because kids don't get it. Uh, yeah. I it's don't the, know. It's the children who are wrong. 
Well, yes, yeah. it's the children who are wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah. We, you can hear that we didn't really care for this movie. Uh, I know that a lot of people really do like it. And there are some who like it ironically because of the memes. But if you like it, that's perfectly fine. I know that, you know, it's going to be the same thing with Monsters University all over again, in which we didn't like the movie. And then there's somebody who's saying like, oh, how dare you not like it? I like that movie. I like it, everything about it. Yeah. So like, how dare you give it a low score? It's like, it's our opinion, everybody. Everybody. You don't way. have to take it to heart and just, you know, let us, you know, let us state what we feel about it. By, if you by don't the way, feel the same to, way, yeah. that's fine. By, by the way, just to hammer my point about uh, the amount of cuts that they did with this, well, uh, Megan McC- uh, Mullally, uh, who uh, was supposed to, she, they gave, they had a whole character for her called Trudy, and she was also, um, she was vo- she was always actor in uh, one of the other DreamWorks films, which I think she's going to come up later on. Uh, she had a whole role given to her, and they cut her completely out of the film. Hmm. Yeah, she was she was yeah. a voice called uh, a voice character called Trudy, who I believe uh, was a character who was in the script but was then cut short. So yeah, uh, it, it seemed I, I would like to see what the original um, unedited script would have been about. Like I, I would have liked to have seen uh, what the overall product would have been like if there were some things that weren't cut from the final product. In fact, I'm uh, by the time that you're listening to this, I may or may not even release an episode of my podcast discussing about cut scenes or cut songs from Disney movies. So we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, you'll be there for a while because uh, you know, Disney will be cutting things since uh, Snow White. Like, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, watch, uh, watch out for the three-hour-long podcast about Disney stuff. Yeah. So this film did. Uh, uh, well, this film took 150 million to make. How much? How how long? How many? How much did it take to make ants? Uh, again, like uh, it, it, it was a lot less. A uh, lot uh, less. Yeah. Uh, let me just. I'm just gonna look it up really quickly. It took, according oh. to it, um, 42 to 60 million or 100 uh, million. Uh, it depends uh, because sorry, it was there's a, been a lot of conflict. Yeah. It was 105 million dollars. Uh, for yeah. us, and so uh, the uh, and this took so this was like forty so forty five million dollars didn't give you any better film than Ants, like so you, yeah, you got, you got, and, and this was like and you know Ants came out like almost ten years you know before B movie, and it mm-hmm. you know it again conflicting arguments about how much money it took to make Ants, but essentially it made uh, it, it took a lot less money to make Ants than compared to B movie. So, uh, and also some of that as well, it's, uh, I don't know how it did it, but, uh, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. It, it, the fact that it got 50% of Rotten Tomatoes, it should have got far harsher criticism for me. I mean, yeah. I, I'm kind of, I, I, maybe the 50% who did like this movie were fans of Seinfeld. I don't know. So, um, thankfully we have not gone for an hour, we've only gone for about 36 minutes. So, yeah, but that, that's probably the longest that we've gone so far in Dream Machine. So uh, thank you so much for listening to Aaron's 30-minute therapy session. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. And please, if you have any issues with B-Movie that you would like to share amongst the counseling group, leave it in the comments below and we'll try our best to sympathize. Well, I don't know, something. Yeah. Okay, so for me, Aaron. And Patricia. Take care and bye-bye for now. See you later.